Hello, my name is Matt Krill, and I'm going to do an overview or introduction to information systems in medical imaging. So first, we'll talk about the major components that are needed for data management in medical imaging. First is the network. Medical images are very large files, and most hospitals internally have one gigabit per second or better network speeds. Uh, as a comparison, if you have ever looked at what your upload speeds are at home, it could be 10 megabits per second. So you can see that the needs for medical imaging internally within a hospital are very large. Uh, it's not uncommon to have 10 gigabit per second speeds from the server room to, say, a radiologist workstation. And then we have our different systems that are sending information over those network bandwidth connections. The first one is the hospital information system, the HIS. It's also sometimes referred to as the electronic medical record or EMR. Next we have the radiology information system or RIS. This is the system that's often a just a subset or component within the HIS that is sp used specifically by radiology for registering a patient or entering orders and that's also generally where the reports are stored. And last we have the picture archiving and communication system or PACS. This is where the reports are often generated as well as primarily the function here is for the storage of all the images that are created across a hospital as well as the ability to then pull those images and view them. So even though in radiology we use PACs every day and usually with every single patient, it's sometimes confusing what system you're actually using. Commonly today, PACs sort of has a backseat role to the EMR as far as what you're clicking on and logging into. So at the computer where you're doing your image quality control, you might be logging into your hospital EMR, which could be Cerner, Epic, Meditech, Allscripts. There's many different EMR vendors. And what you're doing is logging into the EMR, clicking on the patient, and then that EMR is linked to the PACs so that it, it pulls across a uh, compressed image that you can quickly do your review and then pass off to the radiologist. The radiologist is not going to be looking at the studies through the EMR. They're going to be using the actual PAX client so that they are able to view an uncompressed image that's the full resolution needed for a diagnostic review. That's not always the case for you as the technologist. There are sites where you could potentially be logging directly into the PACs and not through the EMR. There are different scenarios and different ways to build these systems. So again, just to show that difference, we've got our workstation on the left with the EMR view of an image. So you can see that the data is being requested via the EMR and then the PAX data center is serving up those images. So there are three computer parts that we should talk about next. First is the CPU or central processing unit. This is the brains of the computer and performs calculations. This also has a lot to do with the speed and the number of jobs or processes that can be performed at one time. Uh, and then next we have the RAM the, which is, stands for the Random Access Memory. This is a short-term storage that stores data from the programs that are currently in use on the computer or your cell phone. And then last we have the hard drive, which is the storage. And this is where information can be read or written for processing and retrieving and additional processing of information that's stored in a computer. Next we'll talk about emergency contingency planning. So there's three components to that. High availability, business continuity, and disaster recovery. So if you look at data center one and data center two, they each have two servers. So in modern PAX infrastructure we use what are called virtual machines. So if you think back to the previous slide, the servers in this instance are going to only contain 
uh, CPUs and RAM. And then the storage RAID array is where all the hard drives are. So if you think about the cell phone that you're holding, it's got one hard drive, one CPU, and some RAM. If any of those three components were to go bad, your phone would no longer work. So we don't want to have that same thing happen to PAX. So what we do is in this high availability environment, and you see that orange arrow pointing to server one and server two, because those two servers are just filled with CPUs and RAM, the virtual servers are then, the, the information for those are stored below in that RAID array, the, in the storage. And then they use the CPUs and the RAM in the servers to function. So if one of those servers were to go bad and be removed from that data center, the other server would still be functioning and be able to be leveraged by the storage. And the same functionality is provided within the storage RAID array. RAID stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. So what happens is, is there's a multitude of hard drives within that storage array. And if any single disk were to go bad, that information is replicated across the other disks so it can be just removed and replaced without data loss or without disruption of your daily activities. So that's high availability. The, the hardware has redundancy in it so that if there's a hardware failure it doesn't interrupt the daily operations. Next we have business continuity. So in this case we have the yellow arrow showing the replication between data center one and data center two. So data center one and data center two are copies of each other. If data center one were to have a fire and everything there is destroyed, we have our network pointed at both of these data centers so that data center two can be activated as the primary site and the end users at the computer level at the hospital, they don't know that there was any disruption in data center one because data center two is a full redundant copy for business continuity. Now, in that same scenario, if data center one is destroyed, how do we recover it? We want to have that redundancy of two data centers you know, for the disaster uh, scenario. So we are able to then rebuild data center one by again, you know, re repairing that hardware and then we can replicate what's in data center two back into data center one. So next we'll talk about the two types of data that are, are used in medical imaging are HL7, which is health level seven, which is textual or written data. And then we have DICOM, which is digital imaging and communication in medicine. That is the imaging protocol that's used for the images themselves. So we've got the textual or written data in the HL7 and then the image data in the DICOM format. So if we high level look at the data flow that happens is a patient arrives in the hospital and the patient's information is entered into the HIS-RIS which is then uh, and including you know the, the order and you know that's where the accession number would be generated and all that information is sent via HL7 to PACS. PACS then converts that textual data into information that's provided in a DICOM header format to the modality so that when you as the technologist go to the modality and the patient's name and information is already there that's called the DICOM modality work list so this is an important step that you need to, to understand is that if the patient has not been properly registered and had their order information entered into the HIS-RIS so that it can be sent to PACS and then PACS can send that information to the modality that you're able to pick that patient from the modality work list prior to performing the study. Then those images, if the flow is done correctly, those images are automatically populated in the DICOM header with all the information that was entered back at the time of registration. If you do not pick the patient from the modality work list. None of that information travels with the images. So then once the study arrives in PACS, 
the sort of chain of information is broken that the radiologist is going to uh, maybe attempt to read the study and it's going to say the order is missing and it won't allow the radiologist to dictate the exam which you know, then will get you called into the radiologist's office to find out why the study is not complete and ready for him to dictate. Go back, we'll summarize that again in the correct workflow. Patient is first registered in the hospital HISRIS which sends HL7 data to PAX. PAX converts it into a DICOM modality work list, which is sent to the modality so that you as the technologist can select that study at the modality, perform your study, and send those DICOM images to PAX. PAX is then able to reconcile that, yes, I have an order from the RIS, and I'm going to match it to these images that have the same study information. Then the radiologist is able to use PAX to create a report and then that report is sent to the hospital HIS-RIS and a link, probably just a, a web URL link, is included with that report so that a end user or referring physician is able to view those images through the hospital EMR or HIS-RIS. So you should be aware that everything you do, everything you click on, everything you look at, within the EMR and PACS is tracked and logged for review. HIPAA sets the guidelines for these audits and there are administrators that will randomly and periodically do audits on users or patients to see who looked at their images or what user is accessing and, and viewing. And the purpose for this is to proactively monitor for fraud or abuse and also to perform audits based on maybe a patient complaint or some legal case. So it's very important that you keep this in mind and you follow the HIPAA training that you're given and only access medical information that is relevant to you. And finally, we'll talk about teleradiology. So there's different scenarios for teleradiology and we'll talk about sort of the, the most common. So similar to what we just talked about, the hospital HIS-RIS performs the patient registration and that HL7 data is sent to PACS for the PACS to create a modality work list so that the images can be created with that patient data in the DICOM header. Those images then are forwarded to a teleradiology system who is just another PACS in another location. That HL7 data, that order information that was sent to the hospital PACS, is also sent from the hospital HIS-RIS to the teleradiology system. The teleradiology system needs that information the same as the hospital PACS does to reconcile the images to the order information and the patient information. The teleradiology system is then able to create a report, possibly pull any prior exams from the hospital PACS to the teleradiology system for comparison. That report is generated and then sent to the hospital HIS-RIS via HL7. Now one step in here that you should be aware of is that the report is then also sent back to PACS and the reason for that is PACS needs to know that the study has been reported Otherwise, the radiologist at the hospital might come in the next day and try to read the same study again. So there needs to be another final step in there that the report is sent from the Telerad system to the hospital HIS-RIS, and then finally to PACS, so that all the systems are in sync, that everybody is complete in the job that they were doing.